Alum Cordator. As we discussed in the bulwark, all these members have that sweet, sweet note of cordis, the defining feature of all members of Phylum Cordator. Well, remember, so like, these two could be switched, and these two could be switched, and in fact, as long as these two are together, they could be there, and those two could be there. You see what I'm saying? So what's important are the groupings, right? As long as you have these four, and it's those two, and those two, those two, and it could be that way or that way, right? Because that's how cladogram making works. So anyway, phylum chordata. We're skipping a kind of dermata. We'll come back to that next week because I haven't written the lecture for it yet. All members have a notochord. What that is, is a dorsal, stiffened, hollow, supportive structure used for locomotion. Make sure you say something about it, give me support. There's vertebrate and invertebrate chordates. All chordates have a notochord, though, that gives them that support. And that support aids a lot in locomotion because it enables, I think, Vanessa, maybe you said it. The tail enables enables chordates to have a tail, right? Usually, it's near containing. In our case, sort of protecting the dorsal nerve cord. Everybody else had a ventral nerve cord, right, running straight down the belly. You guys saw it on the worm. You probably didn't see it in the crayfish, but it was there. And the mollusk it also had it down his ventral side. But these have it running on the dorsal side. You know, like ours. All members of phylum chordata being a part of bilateria, like everything else that's not a kind of dermata, and sponges and cnidarians, has bilateral symmetry. This is that tail. It's called a post anal tail, means it's where? Where's the tail? Well, what's post? I heard it. Who wants 20 points? Don't be shy. After, good. The internet knows that he knows it means after. Post it after the anus tail. So like the worm, the very end of it was the anus. Crayfish, very end of it, anus. At the very end of the grasshopper, anus. Now we have the anus and then a tail after it. Does that make sense to everybody? Post anal tail. They also have a ventral heart, whereas you notice in the crayfish and the grasshopper and everybody else had a dorsal heart, right? Even, the, even in, the, in the, the worms, right? You cut open the dorsal side, you have those pseudo hearts sitting there on the dorsal side of the esophagus. So we have a ventral heart. Basically, the chordates took like everybody else's main like body plan and like flipped it for some reason. It makes me think that maybe actually we used to be, and then something happened where like our heads got flipped around or something. Yeah. Anyway, we also have a complete digestive system. I mean, so does everything else that we've dissected, so whatever. Here it is, the basic body pan of a chordate. You'll notice here is the notochord. See how it's not on the outside. This is called more superficial towards the skin. More superficial is the nerve cord. So this is more for supporting the body than it's ever been for protecting the nerve cord. You guys see that? Now ours kind of wraps around a little bit. There's the postanal tail. See the anus, not at the end. Intestine leads to it. The other thing that's cool about all chordates, you remember the, the pharynx, right? That big muscle in the worm came out. We have a pharynx back of our throat. All chordates have slits in the pharynx called pharyngeal slits. You definitely want to get that written down. Slits in the pharynx called pharyngeal slits. All chordates have them at the embryo stage. The more basal chordates, like this is a, this looks like a cephalochordate. The more basal invertebrate chordates have them through adulthood as well. So all chordates have those pharyngeal slits in the embryonic stage, and the more basal chordates they have them in adulthood. What's the function of the gill slits or the pharyngeal slits? Like you said, sometimes they get used as gills. Sometimes in this in this this case they're not gills they're feeding they're filters for feeding. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm.
anybody know what this is? Is it a, is it a what? No, speak. Use your words. Don't worry. I'm not, it's not like I'm going to turn the camera around and say your name, Rylan. <laughs> Elizabeth. A lung. A lung. Lung would be somewhere in there. A lung has a heart. Uh, well, way before it was a baby, even before it's a fetus, this is a picture of a human embryo. You see these slits right here? You see the slits, don't you? Pharyngeal slits. Now, did we need gill slits when we were in the womb? Some of you guys are not in. So it's some, no, no, no. All our, all our food, all our waste, all our gas exchange went through the umbilical cord including the whole oxygen CO2 trade. As you, get, as you grow and develop, you get a heart, you get a lungs. The lungs aren't really functioning so much. The heart's pumping the blood around. But here, this is where all the gas exchange is happening. So gills inside there. Remember, gills only work when water moves through them, right? So unless the fetus is like, ah, ah, right? That's not it. They wouldn't even function anyway. Or had like a crayfish thing. I saw the crayfish had them like on their legs so they'd be like, breathe. Breathe, right? They move their limbs to move their lungs, well, to move their gills. Yeah, these are, this is what we call an evolutionary legacy. You should write that down, evolutionary legacy. A lot of times we'll use these as apomorphies. These are traits that evolved, but they didn't necessarily give an advantage. It's sort of like the appendix. It's a leftover. Not a disadvantage, so it wasn't selected against. But this is evidence that all the chordates share that evolutionary relationship because we all have those pharyngeal slits at the embryonic stage. Do, does that make sense? That's one of the ways that, that uh, evolutionary biologists have classified chordates. So, here's a cladogram showing all the chordates. Look down here, you'll see that we're branching off some kind of echinoderm-like thing, right, because chordates and echinoderms branched. So we got some kind of echinoderm and ancestor thing. And then we jump in here. There are two basal clades called urochordates and cephalochordates. The urochordates, if you look closely there, it looks almost like a sponge. But it's got all those features. It's got the dorsal nerve cord, notochord, pharyngeal slits, the whole deal. The cephalochordates, that's like the picture I showed you before. They've got a little bit more motion. And then we move up, right? We invent vertebrae. We got one, two, three classes. Urochordata. Cephalochordata and vertebrata. See the vertebrata? Vertebrata includes all the, so every vertebrate, that means like you and fish have more in common than these two have with each other, even though they're both invertebrates. And then we can move up, right? We go through fish, we got amphibians, reptiles branched off as aves. Notice that that dinosaur should be up here with the other birds where it belongs. And then we got mammals, including ones that lay eggs and ones that don't lay eggs. That's right, some mammals lay eggs. Like monotremes and echidnas. And then there's basically two groups, right? We got marsupials, right? Like a, like a kangaroo and the echidna. Embryo has to, the fetus has to crawl out, get in the pouch. Whereas placentals have a placenta, internal pouch for the growing embryo. Yes or yes? Yeah. See how all that works? We're going to look at class amphibia in depth. Why, you ask? Because we're going to dissect a member of class amphibia. Amphi means? See, the longer you take, the longer seventh period is going to have to wait. Uh, both are double. Yeah, both are double. So the livers of the double Life, not liver like the organ, liver's like they're living it. They're living life. They live the double life. Younger, like, like what would be the version of like a toddler or an adolescent, they've got like that tadpole type thing where they're a totally aquatic, need to be in the water. Then they grow, they go through metamorphosis, they develop, and then they're land-based. So amphibians, they need to be near water, but they also need to be near land. Because the adults need land, the babies need water. The larval stages use gills to breathe, provided by, you guessed it,
Yeah, the pharyngeal slits. No, not their health insurance plan. The pharyngeal <laughs> slits gives them the, right? Adults, though, use lungs. So you have internal gills, and you saw gills, all feathery and, and whatnot. When they go through that metamorphosis to become an adult, no more gills. The gills get replaced with lungs, which work, you know, with gases, with air. Gills do gas exchange through water. Lungs got to have air moving through. Both require a moist environment because, in general, the adults don't have waterproof skin. So they're going to lose a lot of water, so they need to be near water, not just so they can reproduce, but also so they can rehydrate, right? They need to keep their skin kind of moist. Ever picked up a frog or a toad even? Their skin's usually kind of slimy. Yeah, they're sweating. They're all cold-blooded, all amphibians like reptiles, they're cold-blooded. Their homeostasis does not include thermoregulation. Salinity, yes. Isotonicity, yes. Temperature, uh-uh. They don't have scales. That's the difference between amphibians and reptiles. Reptiles can live in those really dry, arid regions and the wet regions, but they can live in those dry regions because the scales are like waterproofing. Like we've got, the skin is waterproof. Amphibians don't have that. No waterproofing. They also don't have claws. Which kind of makes you think, um, how is it even possible for these things to survive? I mean, we're talking like the babies have to swim, the adults have to be near water but also have access to land, they have no waterproofing, they can't control their temperature, they don't even have claws. They sound wimpy and terrible. They can eat flies. Oh boy. <laughs> Additionally, many of them have developed poison or toxin or, right, as a defense mechanism. Yeah, a newt that gets eaten is still dead, but if that newt's got a serious neurotoxin that it's providing, predators are going to figure out pretty quick, hey, don't eat the newts. Same thing for frogs, all those really bright, colorful frogs. Even on their skin, they're secreting a toxin all the time. However, not all of them do it, and they still survive. It's not just about eating the flies, it's that... They are aggressive predators. Not passive, not wimpy, aggressive. So the larvae, they've got those pharyngeal slits, they're herbivorous, they'll eat like phytoplankton, they'll eat zooplankton, some will eat each other. If it's small enough to fit through the slits, it's going through the slits. The adults, though, tend to be carnivorous and they're super duper aggressive. How aggressive, you ask? Here, here's, the, here's the decision tree for, am I going to eat that if you're a frog? Does it look like it's smaller than me? Is it moving? Both those are yes, it's getting eight. Doesn't matter what it is, where it is, could be a rock blown in the wind, smaller and moving, I'm eating it. Could be a fly buzzing around, smaller and moving, I'm eating it. Could be your finger that you're dragging across the table. Smaller or moving? I'm going to try and eat that. Baby frog. Is it smaller than me? Is it moving? I'm going to eat it. Grown up frog. Is it smaller than me? And moving? I'm going to eat that. Mouse. Is it smaller than me and moving? I'm going to eat it. They do not. If it's moving, they're eating it. They've got this tongue. Where's your tongue attached? Yeah, in the back of your mouth, right? Like almost to the throat. Their tongues attack in a front around. The thing of the pivot, right? It's got like a ah, 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 ah. See it? It's attached in the front of the mouth. It comes, and grabs the food, and then it shoves the food straight to the back of the throat. Frogs swallow their food whole. On top of that, they don't have a whole lot of teeth in here. They do have a layer of what's called maxillary teeth. You'll feel them. Fish have a similar thing, right? It feels like, like sandpaper. And then they have these two big vomerine teeth here for smasherating. Mmm, smasherating. Here's the tongue. Notice it's almost got like little hands, right, for grabbing. Sticks it back there. They close their mouth. The maxillary teeth make an airtight, watertight seal. You're not getting out once you're in a frog's mouth. That's it. Shoves the food towards the back of the throat, starts swallowing. Here's the great part. The tongue's pushing down, and guess what's on the other side of these two pouches? 
Right. The eyeballs. The frog, when they swallow their food, they close their eyes and they literally push down on the food with their eyeballs. Now you felt how hard the squid eyeball was, right? I mean, it's, well, imagine, like you're pushing food down your throat using your eyes. It's like, oh, that's, that's aggression right there. Like, I want to eat this so bad, I could mess up my eyesight over eating it. You'll be able to feel, when you dissect the frog, when you get its mouth open, put your finger right there, take your other hand, push on the eyeball, or have your partner push on the eyeball. You'll be able to feel it push back against your fingers. It's really cool. It's really cool. Is any, anybody have any questions about the frog so far? Let's talk organ systems. On the inside, they've got all these organs. Don't bother writing them down. You're going to see them in the dissection lab. You're going to label them. Tell me which of these organs the humans have. The esophagus. <laughs> yes, the esophagus. Yeah, we have all these, we have, except for cloaca. We have separate openings for liquid and solid waste. They have like a one opening, one like a catch-all opening. Anything that's going out of the frog goes through the cloaca. In fact, externally, there's no way to tell a male from a female. Usually the males will be a little bigger, but then you don't know, do I have a young frog? Is that why it's smaller? You'll only be able to tell the sex of the frog once you get it open. Sort of like the squids, right? You see the eggs in there, you know it's a female. Same thing with the frogs. You open it up, you'll see eggs, or you'll see sperm duct going all over the place. Can the frogs tell each other's apart? Like... Yeah. They've, they've got like a hormone pheromone thing going on. Okay. But yeah, that means even, even the sperm during mating time comes out of the cloaca. Right? They've got the respiratory system. They have lungs, so they can do breathing. But, like we said, their skin's not waterproof, which means it's also not vapor-proof. So they can do gas exchanges right through their skin. Right? You'll see, when you open up the frog, look at its skin, you'll see all of these blood vessels. Really, really fine blood vessels, like, like woven in there everywhere. Right? It's doing gas exchange right through the skin. Right? Trading CO2 for oxygen. They have a chambered heart, but it's not like ours. Our heart has how many chambers? Four chambers, right? The atria filter into the ventricles, right? And we've got separate halves of the heart for oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, right? Your right ventricle gets deoxygenated blood, pumps it up into the heart or into the lungs where it gets filled up with oxygen. Then that filters down into your left atria. Then that goes to the left ventricle. The left ventricle has got the big muscle. That's why it feels like your heart's on the left side of the chest, even though it's in the middle, because this one's got the big muscle. It goes, boom, pumps it through the whole body. So we're separating the blood with oxygen and the blood without oxygen. Frog hearts, though, the blood has to run through the body twice because they've got two atria, so they're separating oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in their two atria, but they only have one ventricle. So they're separating it, and then they're just mixing it all together anyway. So they've got this like pseudo-oxygenated blood, like halfway job, running through their body. So that can work because they can also do gas exchanges through their skin, because they're not waterproof. <coughs> they didn't need a fourth chamber. Three chambers evolved. Three chambers was good enough. Didn't give them a significant disadvantage. But that means that the blood gets pumped through twice with every ventricle hit. Does that make sense? See how it's different from us? Right, we have waterproofing, so we had, to, we had to separate the blood more. You guys ready for frog dissection slides? Yeah. What questions do you have about the frog?